Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous lecture, we started our discussion of probability models and how we can use probability and stochastic processes to build mathematical models of the real world. Now, in the previous section, or in the previous lecture, we discussed discrete probability models. That's when your random variable can only take on a discrete number of uh, items, in this case. So again, the, the example was, say, rolling a dice, right? There's only six possibilities, the numbers one through six, that come up on a standard six-sided die. Well, in this lecture, we would like to discuss continuous probability models. And let's start with the idea of a probability distribution function. So in this case, we will write the probability associated to a continuous random variable being less than or equal to some number as a function f of x, okay? So in this case, x, capital X, is my random variable. It can take on a continuum of values, okay? So it could take on pi, it could take on e, it could take on 10, you know, anything along the, say, the real line. And we are saying that the probability that this is less than some number, three, five, seven, whatever that number is, is given by some function f of x. We call this function a probability distribution function. Now on top of that, we typically denote little f of x to be the derivative of this probability distribution function, and we call this thing the density function. Okay, so this is density, this is distribution. Now, there's an important piece to be made here because this might be actually a difficult thing to have. Typically what you're given in practice is the density function. And so what that means is that we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to determine when your continuous random variable lies inside of an interval, okay? So in this case, if x is between a and b, this is going to be f of b, the probability that you're less than or equal to b, minus the probability that you are less than or equal to a, right? So this is everything less than b, but get rid of everything less than a. The fundamental theorem of calculus relates these two things and says that this is the same as integrating from a to b of little f of x dx. Okay, so this is what I mean. Typically, we get things like a density function, this little f of x, and it says if we want to calculate any of these probabilities, it's just an integration problem, right? So if you've done a lot of uh, probability in the past, you'll know that it is very much entangled uh, with integration. And especially if you've gone further, you'll notice that it slowly gets tangled into measure theory, which again is very intimately related to how we think about integration. All right, so the next piece of this, we have to ask ourselves, what is the expected value when you have these continuous random variables? Well, in this case, this little f of x describes our probabilities that are coming out of this thing. Our, uh, we are going to take basically an infinite sum of f of x times x uh, integrated over the whole space. Now in this case, I'm making the assumption that my continuous random variable capital X can take on values anywhere on the real line, but if it's maybe restricted to just positive values, so from zero to infinity, that would just change these bounds of integration, okay? So nothing really is specific to the fact that I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity. You can put your own bounds on this thing. It makes no real difference to the presentation. But the point here is that, again, you get this density function multiplied by x. And where this really comes from is you can think about the limit of discrete probability events going to infinity. So you can think about a sum turning into an integral through a Riemann sum. 
It's the same basic idea, right? If you divide up the domain into more and more pieces, that thing slowly becomes or converges into an integral the way you learn in basic calculus. That's where we get this integral representation. You should always think of integrals as just like continuous sums. Okay, so in my case, again, I said I'm not going to do a complete general introduction to all things probability. I would like to focus on a specific probability density function, okay? Now, I would like to focus on, now I'm going to use t as my independent variable, typically because this corresponds to time, and I'm going to look at situations that look like this. So this is telling me that the probability of an event happening is given by this function where I have a, a rate parameter, lambda, which is greater than zero. Now, what first thing, before we explain what this means, the bigger lambda is, the faster this goes to zero, okay? The smaller lambda is, the, the slower this goes to zero. So what does that probability typically represent? It represents uh, waiting for something, waiting for an event to happen. It says the longer you wait, the higher the probability that that event is going to happen. Sometimes people put this in terms of arrivals. So maybe you're working at a store. You are, you know, it's been a while since a customer came in, but on average one comes in every hour. Well, if it's at 55 minutes, then the probability that a customer will come in, you know, is probably much higher than if a customer just walked in the door. That's what this is trying to explain to us. Then the next thing that we can see is that the density function associated to this is going to be lambda e to the lambda t. And we have the fact that we can easily sort of compute all of these probabilities of anything. So we could say, you know, what's the probability that uh, customers come, you know, in two hours, but no less than one hour. Well, we can just compute these things using this beautiful formula right here. Now, let's actually talk about one important aspect of this. And, and to do that, I'm going to go back to the theory for a moment, okay? So I want to talk about a conditional probability, okay? So let's say the probability of an event A happening given that B already happened. Okay, this is going to be the probability that both of them happen, so an intersection of these, divided by the probability that B happens. Okay, so this gives me an explicit likelihood saying that how can I estimate if A is going to happen or what's the probability A will happen if I already know that B happened, right? Well, the interesting thing about the, the exponential distribution is that it has what's called a lack of memory. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's call this the lack of memory. And this is unique to the exponential distribution or distributions that are similar to it. So this would say that the probability that x is greater than s plus t given x is greater than s. Well, let's write this out using the formula to start with here. This is the probability that x is bigger than x plus t. That's the and, right? If s is positive, then the and here is weighting s plus t, and this is just weighting s. Then divided by the probability that x, sorry, capital X, is greater than s. So the probability of weighting s plus t time units divided by the probability of just weighting s units. Well, in this case, we can just compute these probabilities. And this is going to give me e to the minus lambda s plus t divided by e to the minus lambda s, which you can see is going to be taken away here, and I get e to the minus lambda times t, which is just equal to the probability that x is greater than t. So what does this actually mean? 
It means that if we've already weighted S units, okay, and then we want to know what the probability of something happening T more units into the future does, well, that's just the same as restarting and saying what happens in T units from now. It means that it doesn't matter how long I waited. All that matters is how far you go in the future now. The past doesn't matter. There is no memory in this thing, okay? We forget that we waited that long. It's like a dog waiting for something, right? It's, it doesn't matter that I just went for a walk. When are we going for the next one, right? That's what this is saying. Okay, now that we have an idea of continuous probability distributions, let's take a look at a math modeling example, okay? So, I wanna use an example of radioactive decay. And in particular, a type one encounter is gonna be used to measure the radioactive decay in a sample of a fissionable material. Okay, so I'm being purposely vague here. Um, but, all right, decays occur at random and at an unknown rate. And the purpose of the counter is to measure the decay rate, all right? So each radioactive decay locks the counter for a period of three times 10 to the minus nine seconds, okay? So that's how long the counter takes to register a decay in this thing. It's a very, very small amount of time. But at, during this locking, we can't record any other decays. So it's possible that we miss lots of decays in this little tiny time frame, depending on the material. So the question is, you know, how should the data received from the counter be adjusted to account for any lost information? Okay, so a slightly more complicated example than maybe we're used to, but this is a really, really fun one. So what I wanna do is I wanna let lambda equal to the decay rate, so decay rate of the material, and this is gonna be per second. Then what I would like to do is like to be Tn equal to the time of the nth observation. And in this case, it's the, the observation of a, of a decay by the machine. Now, the first thing is the locking that we have to account for, right? So the first thing that we know here is that Tn minus Tn minus one is greater than or equal to three times 10 to the minus nine. Why? Because the system locks for this period of time, three times 10 to the minus nine seconds. So it means that nothing can be recorded inside of there. So if we are just looking at observations out of this system, that means that the time between these things is guaranteed to be at least this tiny, tiny, tiny length of time, okay? So we are going to model this thing as a continuous probability model, but we are not there yet. We need to introduce some intermediary variables. Okay, so the first thing is that let's define, let's set xn to be the time between these observations, okay? So this is now moving me from, you know, this, these observations that are taken. So the first observation, the second observation, the third observation. And what I'm doing now is measuring the interval of time that comes between these things. I would like to find a sort of probability distribution that describes, you know, how often these things come through. But again, this is not an exponential distribution. Remember, the exponential distribution says sort of the longer I wait, the, uh, the higher probability that an event is going to take place. But this thing is, uh, it is greater than or equal to 3.10 to the minus nine with probability one, right? And that comes from the locking. So this thing is not an exponential distribution because of this locking time. So here's what I would like to do, okay? I'm gonna also set A to be the locking time. And then I'm gonna set the waiting time, Xn, to be the locking time plus this observation time, okay? So in this case, 
yn is the additional number of seconds that you need to wait until you see another decay. Okay, so locking time and then the additional time that you need to wait. And in this case, yn is modeled, well, is, is modeled by an exponential distribution. with this parameter, this decay parameter, to be lambda greater than zero, right? So again, the, if the decay rate is very, very high, that means that you have very, very quick succession of observations, and that means that yn should be expected to be very, very small. Okay, so next thing I would like to do is I'd like to compute the average waiting time, okay? So the x uh, the expected value of the waiting time between observations, okay? So I want to know how long I should be expecting to wait here. Well, this thing is going to be, I, my, exp, my expectation distributes over sums. The expectation of a constant is just that constant, right? Because it's, this is not a random variable. It's always equal to A. So I expect every single waiting time to be the locking time plus however long I should be expecting yn. Now, yn is modeled by an exponential distribution, so I can actually compute it. My exponential distribution, its average or its expected value in this case is going to be zero to infinity that comes from the fact that my time starts at zero and it can go as long as you want. So this is what I was talking about on the previous board. Whenever your bounds of integration are sort of relative to the problem. I know that I used minus infinity to infinity previously, but you can use any sort of subdomain of the real numbers, still the same basic premise. And then T and then times e, uh, lambda e to the minus lambda T dt, which in this case is equal to 1 over lambda. Okay, so that means that I can put all of this together and I get that my expected waiting time is equal to, well, the locking time plus 1 over lambda. Okay, so the question is, what can I actually do with this? How can this help me to maybe estimate my decay rate? Again, I don't know what the decay rate is. The only thing that I have access to in this whole problem is the TNs, when I make these observations. Okay, well, I would like you to recall maybe the strong law of large numbers. Okay, so the strong law of large numbers says that if I have a bunch of random variables, all of which have the same mean, then the average of all of those random variables is going to be the average uh, that, uh, or it's going to be their expected value, the mean that they all share in common. Let me actually write this down properly in this context, okay? All of these waiting times if I average out all of the waiting times and I let the number of observations go to infinity, then in this case, uh, this thing is going to be equal to the expected value of all of these xn's. So in this case, it's equal to a plus 1 over lambda. But I want to show you a little trick here, right? So if you look at that denominator here, well, this thing is actually a telescoping sum. So note that x1 plus x2 all the way up to xn, well, look at what the definition of these things are. This is going to be t1 minus t0, uh, and then plus 
So t0 is equal to 0, right? That, that is when I start the clock. And then uh, t2 minus t1, okay? So the t1s cancel. This is equal to 0 plus all the way up tn minus tn minus 1. So this tells me that every single term cancels in this thing except for tn. And again, remember t0, that's, we can set that to be 0. That's whenever you make, like, when, that's when you start the clock. So what does this tell us? This tells me that the time of my nth observation divided by n, that's this piece of the limit, well, as long as n is large, this is basically going to be converged to this thing right here. Okay, so I'm using squiggly lines here because this only holds true in the limit. So if I take n really, really large, I get close to the limit, this should be approximately equal. So this tells me that I can actually estimate my decay rate as n divided by tn minus n times a. And actually, we'll make these squiggly as well. Again, this only holds in the limit as n goes to infinity. But look at how cool this is. Just by assuming this exponential distribution, we can actually estimate the decay rate of the radioactive material by looking at the nth observation here while also accounting for the locking time, okay? So even though we can't record observations inside of this time frame, we can account for it and we can still figure out the decay rate, right? Even if this thing decays super, 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 super fast, right? Maybe there's a hundred decays that take place inside of this, this time when we're locked, that's okay, right? Our model accounts for that. And therefore, as long as I keep tracking all of these successive, uh, these, these successive observations when I can, I can approximate the decay rate of this radioactive material. That's incredible, right? And it's all just using a very, very simple exponential distribution. Again, this is not a massive logical leap. This exponential distribution is used for all kinds of different sort of waiting or arrival processes, right? So I used the example of being a shopkeeper. That's a pretty natural one. But these, these radioactive substances, again, the longer you wait, the more, the higher the probability you would expect to see some kind of decay in these things. Okay, so we could, again, investigate a little bit of sensitivity here. Now, the first thing when it comes to sensitivity of this is the fact that I actually have this only in the limit. Remember, the strong law of large numbers only holds as the limit as n goes to infinity. That means that I probably need to make a lot of observations before I can see nice convergence of this thing. Okay, so that's the first piece of sort of wiggle room or error that can be incurred in our model, right? So we have to be very, very careful. The strong law of large numbers only happens in the limit. Here, I got rid of the limit, I made the approximation. So I want you to be very, very careful of that, okay? Now, another thing is that this is a very, very small number and it could be slightly inaccurate. So what we could ask ourselves is what is the sensitivity to the locking time? So we could note that the decay rate as a function of the stopping time, A, so if I set this equal here, right, because I'm going to try and estimate this from the data that's being brought in, this is just equal to lambda squared. So you can do the derivative yourself. It's very interesting. It's kind of fun. But this tells me that the sensitivity of lambda with respect to a is equal to, so lambda squared times a over lambda, which is equal to lambda times a. Okay, so what does that actually represent, right? So lambda is the decay rate. So how many, how much of a decay, uh, how much decay you expect per second a is the number of seconds that you are locked for. So the question is, 
what does this actually represent? So first of all, if A is very, very small, then this thing should be expected to be small as well. But what is the sensitivity right there? That sensitivity is, again, decay rate per second times number of seconds. That number right there represents how many decays should be expected to be taking place while the system is locked, okay? So if lambda is very, very large, then you're missing lots of information, right? When the system is locked, there's tons of decay happening. You're missing all of it. And similarly, if lambda is really, really small, then when the system is locked, you're not really missing anything. And that tells you that you're relatively insensitive. So this is really, really interesting to me because this tells me that my sensitivity is really just a question of how much, I'm, how much information I lose every time I lock the system. So if I can drive down how long this thing locks, I lose very little information. I really see you know, directly from time to time how much or when these uh, decays take place. But if the system locks for longer, then I could potentially be missing decays and therefore I'm a little bit more sensitive in this case, right? Because I'm missing a little bit of information from my, um, from my system. So again, the sensitivity value would depend on the values of lambda and A in particular for these things. You can actually maybe compute them out. But what to me is more interesting is the symbolic representation here and that our solution tells us that we can estimate the decay rate even though we have the stopping but we do have this sensitivity right what the longer we stop for the potential for losing more information and that is a beautiful wrap up to this problem and an application of continuous time probability modeling and models in mathematical modeling now, when we come back in the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about statistics and uh, the normal distribution, the bell curve. Uh, and we're going to keep building on some of these ideas of using probability models in order to model real world phenomena and coupling it with a lot of the intuition and the information that we've already built up. I'll see you in the next video, everybody.